Hello and welcome to AmericanNavalHistory.com. My name is John Sorensen and this series of lessons is intended to teach the history of the United States and the critical role that the American Navy has played in that history. Today I want to talk about an episode in the history of the Revolutionary War known as the Penobscot Expedition. Now the Penobscot Expedition was probably one of the, one of the worst, if not the worst, naval disaster in all of American history. In one day, we lost 19 warships and maybe 20 transports all in one day. It was probably the worst day in the history of the United States Navy. And probably though, the, the most ironic thing about this defeat was that the, the mission that these ships were deployed on was virtually meaningless to the, to the whole effort of the war. In the big picture of the war, this mission that these ships were on was totally meaningless. Okay, I want to show you all this overview map to get a, a, pic, a big picture of what's going on in the war during the summer of 1779. Okay, you can, you can see up there on the far right, you see Halifax. Up there, it's, it's on the island of Nova Scotia, which is part of Canada. Okay, that is a stronghold for the British Navy and the British Army operate out of, out of that Halifax port there. Okay, and then you look, you look further, further on down the coast of Massachusetts, you see Boston. Boston is, is in American hands, and the, um, the British left there on evacuation day in 1776, and the people of Boston were very proud that they had gotten the British, the whole British army out of Massachusetts. Their whole state has, was evacuated in, in March of 1776. And that was a big um, source of pride for them that the British had not been able to come back. And then when you look further south of Boston, you see New York. Now, New York is occupied by the British. It is a main British port there. So New York and Halifax on this map are British. And when you look in between Boston and Halifax, you see Penobscot Bay. Now, Penobscot Bay is in Maine today, but, but at the time, Maine was part of Massachusetts. So, um, but... All of that area up there was very, very sparsely populated. It was, it was no man's land, but it was, it was American held, and it was, it was part of Massachusetts. It was, it was part of the American colonies, but nobody lived there. It was evacuated forest, is, is what all of Maine was at the time. Very, very sparsely populated. So that's what's going on in the big picture, and um, we'll. Okay, well, what, what happens here is about, about the middle of June in 1779, the British take an expedition from Halifax into Penobscot Bay. This, this expedition um, had about 800 British troops and three sloops. Okay, a sloop, you know, a small ship, but um, they, have, they have the three sloops and 800 um, soldiers and they enter Penobscot Bay, and they begin to build a fort. They call it Fort George, and they do it on, on something called Bagaduce Peninsula, okay? And the, there's three, the historians have, have come up with three purposes that they build Fort, fort George over, over there on the deserted coast of Maine, okay? One um, is to establish a British foothold in, Mass, in Massachusetts. Now, the British were the Massachusetts people were very proud that there were no British left in, in Massachusetts, but um, the British wanted to establish a foothold there for future operations to launch future operations out of. Um, number two, they wanted to provide some protection to the to the loyalists or the Tories that that were in the area. They needed a a, a place of refuge. Uh, a nice safe fort that they can come into when the colonists got got stirred up after them. And number three, they, they wanted to establish a little British town um, and uh, 
almost retake the colony by colonizing it. Okay? Now those are the three main reasons that most of the historians give, but I also read one historian called Willis, Willis Abbott, Abbott, okay, and he, he's more, more leans towards this was meant to be a thorn in the side of the New Englanders. The, the British did not, the British wanted to just, just stick a thorn in their side and give them a little irritation. And so they went and they, they established a colony on their soil. And that would, um, that would just uh, give, them, give them a sour taste in their mouth. And they, they wanted just to prove that they could do it. Well, when the news of this colony hit Boston, the, the, of course the, the people in, in Massachusetts felt like, hey, we got the British out of here in 1776, and they're coming back, and we we got to go up there, and we got to kick them out of there, and we got to do it now, because they're building a fort, and if we wait for them to build the fort, then then it's going to be real hard to take them out. So let's let's get up there right now, and we we'll, we need to dislodge them before they fortify their positions. And at, at the time, in, like I said, in, in mid-late June, there were three Continental Navy ships in port at Boston at the time, and there was a lot of um, Massachusetts Navy ships in port, and there were a lot of privateers. And they really had no problem getting volunteers to go on these ships to move the British out of, out of their colony. Okay, here, here is a list of all the American warships that went on this expedition. And I, I use the word American to be all-inclusive as the, the top three on the list were from the Continental Navy. The next three on the list were from the Massachusetts Navy. And it looks like the next five were, were um, privateers contracted by, well, actually, the next five lines on this uh, make up one, two, three, four. 4, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 12 ships from the, uh, contracted by the Massachusetts Navy and one contracted by the uh, New Hampshire Navy. It makes 19 warships all together, you know, all, all under the command of um, Saltonstall. Captain, Commodore Saltonstall was the commanding officer of the Warren, was leading this expedition uh, up to Penobscot Bay. And look at the numbers on this. There were 19 warships that totaled uh, 324 guns and over 2,000 men. And there were about 20 transport ships that went along with the 19 warships. So we're, we're up to about 39 ships here going, in, going on this expedition to dislodge um, three small British schooners with 800 soldiers. Okay, they, the expedition left Boston on July 21, 1779, and arrived in Penobscot Bay on July 25th. Um, the British schooners were the North, had 20 guns, the Albany had 18 guns, and the Nautilus had 18 guns. So you're looking at a whole fleet of three schooners with 56 guns total against 19 warships with 324 ships, 800 men against, two, against over 2,000 men. By far, the, the Americans had a superiority in numbers. I mean, it wasn't even close, to, um, no, numeric, numerically wise, and the British had not built their fort yet. All they had up there was a, a breastwork on the top of the hill. Well, on the 25th of uh, July, when the, when the American fleet arrived there, a, a battle commenced right away that day. And they, they, shot, they shot at each other for about two hours, and not much damage was inflicted on either side. And then all of a sudden the wind shifted so that the American ships could not support each other. Okay, the, 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 they, they couldn't support their, the lines that they were in, and they couldn't, they couldn't defend each other. So... The Americans, they ceased fire, and they, and they stood off at a distance overnight. And they actually, they stood off until July 29th, when what, what happened on July 29th was um, they sent in the Marines to, uh, let me, let's go to the next slide, and we'll talk about that. 
Okay, well, when, they, when the Americans arrived at Penobscot Bay, the British ships were, were lined up in the passage between uh, Nautilus Island and the Bagadoos Peninsula. That's Fort George up there in the middle of the Bagadoos Peninsula, and that's way up a hill. And the, the British on Nautilus Island have a, an artillery battery. They got cannons on, you know, protecting, protecting that waterway, protecting that sea passage there between Nautilus Island and um, Bagadoos Peninsula. So the Americans, they, they, they stood off overnight, and the, uh, the, British, the British fleet, I call it, the, the three British ships, were under the protection of both Fort George, you know, um, and the and the shore battery on Nautilus Island. Well, on the uh, 29th of July, the uh, the Americans they got all the Marines off of all these 19 warships. They collected all the Marines in one place, and the Marines landed on Nautilus Island and took it over. Look real closely at the, at the map there. When the, when the Marines took over Nautilus Island, the flag turned from a British flag to an American flag, and the British ships, they moved out from under the protection of Nautilus Island way back to where they could be protected by the fort and out of the range of the cannons that were now in American hands on Nautilus Island. And actually they were in um, American hands. They were, Paul Revere was the artillery officer in this expedition. But uh, let, me, let me show you how that, how that works again. Th this is really neat. Notice how when the flag changes on Nautilus Island, they, um, the, the British ships move back. Now, I, I'll, I can do that again. Hold on. There. You, you see at, at the beginning when the, when the British are on Nautilus Island, the British ships are right there under the protection of those cannons. And now watch. When the Americans take over Nautilus Island, the British the British ships they back way up and under the protection of Fort George and out of the range of um, Nautilus Island. Okay, so so losing Nautilus Island, um, losing that shore battery caused Captain Mort to uh, to withdraw his ships where the, where they would be protected by by the guns out at Fort George. At this point, Bort, Fort George was nothing more than a breastwork. Okay, they were they were rapidly trying to to um, make it into a fort, a stronger fortification. But early early in this battle, it wasn't much more than just just logs laying on top of each other as a breastwork. Okay, in the meantime, while the Americans were were taking over the battery on on Nautilus Island, the British down down in New York City. Now remember, the British were in New York City. Okay. They learned about this expedition, and, and they deployed their ships from New York up to Penobscot Bay. Okay, and the, the Americans, they also hit the beaches on Bagadoos, uh, I would say, on Bagadoos Peninsula, and that's the main peninsula where Fort George is located there on the map. Okay, they successfully, the Americans, I mean, they um, successfully took, took, a, took over a couple of outer defense positions, that were protecting the fort, and the, the and they forced all the British soldiers back into the fort, so they didn't have their little outlying uh, uh, fortifications or little out, outlying batteries anymore. And the Americans uh, came within uh, 500 yards of, of Fort George at the time. And um, also, also on July 29th, the the American the, this is what the American plan was at this point. Okay, they they were to have the Navy attack the three British schooners, so that the Army and the Marines could attack the fort. You see, the the, the British the British Navy gunfire was in was in p position to uh, protect Fort George and prevent the Americans from attacking it. So the so the American Navy ships were supposed to attack the three British schooners, okay, which would allow the Army to attack the fort. Okay. But then, unfortunately, as, as this plane was supposed to commence the next day on July 30th, the American naval commander, uh, Commodore um, Saltonstone, Saltonstall, okay, he got cold feet. He, he decided that it, he, did not, he did not want to put any of his ships at risk of being fired upon by, by the British fort up on the hill. 
because if he moved in closer to the to the British ships to uh, fire at them, he'd be he'd be under the reign of the uh, British British uh, shore batteries in the fort, and he didn't want to do that. So um, so um, Saltonstall he agreed to attack the three British schooners, but not until after the army took the fort. And the army they they agreed to take the fort, but not until the navy took the three British schooners. And there was a stalemate between the American Navy commander and the American Army commander. And this indecision and bickering went on for several days. Okay? It lasted over a week. And remember, and each day that this is happening, the, the British were constructing their, their fortifications, making their, making, digging in their position, making, their, making it harder and harder to dislodge them. And also, the British Navy was approaching from New York. And so, if the Americans were going to dislodge the British out of Penobscot Bay, they had better do it in a hurry. Because, one, it was getting harder to take the fort, and two, the British Navy was on its way. Okay? And word, word of the standoff got back to Boston. And orders were actually written in writing to Saltonstall telling him to move against the British schooners, okay? But by the time those orders arrived, it was too late, okay? Because on August 13th, two weeks after, after they could have attacked, the British fleet arrived with one ship of the line. I mean, I'm talking about a ship of the line with 64 guns on one ship. Five frigates, and, you know, frig frigates are the... Uh, 44, 38-gun ships, and there were five of them, and in another sloop. Okay, so you got a lot of firepower coming in on the British side, and they're coming right up the bay. And they, and just, just their arrival sealed off the American escape path. Okay, and they bottled up all 19 American ships and the 20 transports. They bottled them up. They bottled them up in the bay, and they could not escape to the sea. They could. They had to flee up the river. Okay, what happens when you go up a river? The the river gets gets narrower and the near, and the river gets shallower the further you go. Okay, most of them went up the river as far as they as far as they could, as far as the draft of their ship would allow them to go. And when when they when they finally had to beach their ships, they abandoned them and they ran off into the woods. All the American sailors ran off into the woods. Okay, mo most of them did manage to burn their ships and they. What they did, they, they burned their ships so that the British could not could not capture them and and reuse them against the colonies. But all the all the sailors ran off into the woods and you know eventually made their way back to, to Boston. Okay, and one 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 source did say that the the Americans did form a battle line initially to oppose the British fleet. But that idea was quickly abandoned when they saw the size of the British force that was that was against them. And when they saw the size of the British force, they just turned town. They ran up river as far as they could. So all all 19 of the American ships that that were seen in that first slide with all the list of the ships, all 19 of those ships, all 324 of the guns that were on those ships were lost. They they just they just turned tail and ran. Um, here here's a couple of the things that the um, words that it, as as I was reading about this battle I will call it a battle as I was reading about this expedition here's some of the words I I came across in the in some of the books that I read. Um, Gardner Allen called it a disaster. Okay, Russell Bourne used the word fiasco. Uh, Willis Albert. Uh, disaster, and and one of my favorite naval writers, Nathan Miller, said this was the sorriest episode in in American naval history. And E. B. Potter called them panicky Americans, and I, I like E. B. Potter too. Um, so you you can just see that this this was probably the worst. If one of the worst, if not the worst, episode in American naval history, and um, when it was all over, Commodore Saltonstall, or the the um, naval commander in in charge of it all, 
he's the one that would not attack the ships until after the army attacked the fort. Um, he was court-martialed, and um, he was dismissed from the Navy. It was, it was all for uh, Commodore Saltonstall. It was, it was over. So the, the, the Penobscot ex expedition was probably, without too much argument, the worst disaster in the history of the uh, American Navy. Um, all 19 warships were lost. Uh, not to mention the 20 or so um, uh, transport ships and all the crews. They, they, this is embarrassing. They, they just had, had they, they ran into the woods and hid. Uh, they made most of them made their way back to Boston, but it was it was an embarrassing, sad situation. Salt and Stall got court-martialed, kicked out of the Navy. Um, not not a happy episode in, in the history of the the United States Navy or the Continental Navy anyways. Um, my name is John Sorensen and thank you for listening to AmericanNavalHistory.com.